So, well, today we are going to be finishing up, if the Lord is willing, John chapter 1. We've been in John chapter 1 for weeks, and we're going to try to wrap it up. Um, and before we do that, how about I'll go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll read. How does that sound? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a holy and righteous and sovereign God. Like Vamsi said earlier, not a blade of grass moves that's outside of your control. There is not a molecule or particle in the universe that moves outside of your control, because if it did, you would not be a sovereign God. Lord, you are not caught unawares by the coronavirus crisis that's spreading worldwide. This is not a surprise to you, and it's something that you've ordained to happen. It doesn't mean that you've created it by means to, to, to punish people or, or for whatever, for evil intent. It means that it's something that's tragic that's happened, that you've allowed to happen. And we know, Lord, that even in the midst of tragedy, even in the midst of things that we don't understand the reasoning why, that all of your plans are good and that they bring about your glory. And Lord, we pray that you would be glorified in this. We pray that you would be glorified in healing. We pray that you would be glorified in saving and in sanctifying. Lord, there are many people in this world that today are scared because of this. They fear for their lives. They fear for the lives of their loved ones. But Lord, you give us hope and assurance by your spirit in the name of Jesus Christ that, um, that no matter what happens to our physical bodies on this earth, that those who are in Christ, those who have put their faith and trust in him, would be saved and would spend eternity face to face with you, removed even from the very presence of sin. And so, Lord, we we pray that you would use this opportunity in this, this tragic time, in this scary time, to draw people to yourself, that they would go seeking peace and that they would find it in your gospel. I pray that you would use us to tell them about the peace that we have. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So today we're in John chapter one. We're going to race to the finish line. And we're going to, which means we're going to be reading verses 35 all the way through 51. Now, these are two related sections. And in my Bible, there's there are two different subheadings, but they're both related to Jesus calling the first disciples. Um, and what part of what we'll get into is they don't actually follow him permanently from this point on. They, they go back to their lives and then he goes and, and then invites them to permanent discipleship later. But today, this is the first time that they meet him. And John, who wrote the gospel of John, is recounting, if we remember, these first few days consecutively. He says, this happened, and then the next day, this happened, and then the next day, this happened, and then the next day. So we're going to look at these these last two days here. Verses 35 and 43 both say the next day. And so we need to keep in mind, this is all very consecutive and very detailed. Um, He's recounting the steps up to where he personally met Christ. And and as life-changing as that was, he even remembers the hour of the day that he met Christ. So um, let's read this together. How about, Vamsi, you read the first section, which is 35 through 42, and then I'll read the second section, which is 43 through 51. Okay. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. His father, He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. 
you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom, the Mo whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So here we've got two days in a row where Jesus is inviting and welcoming these disciples um, to be followers of him. And we can see in the first section, the very first day um, that we're looking at today, we see John. It says the name John. Is this John the Evangelist or John the Baptist? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, that's correct. Anytime we see John's name in this gospel, it's John the Baptist, because John the Evangelist never includes his own name in the story. And that's going to come up again in the same par paragraph. So it says in verse uh, 36 that he looked at Jesus. He looked at Jesus. This isn't a glance. This isn't a, a casual passing, oh, I saw Jesus. This is, he's, he's watching him come by. The, the, the original words here, the language, um, suggests that he was gazing intently as Jesus walked by. He, he wants to see what the Messiah is going to do. He's recognized him as the man that 40 days earlier the Spirit came down and rested on him like a dove as a divine sign that this was the one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit, who would baptize with fire, who would be uh, the Messiah, the King of Israel. So he's gazing, he's watching intently. And you can imagine, he's, he's I'm going to draw my, my Jordan River picture here again. He's here by the Jordan River in, in Bethany. Bethany? Yes, Bethany. And, and he sees Jesus walking by, and he's looking at him. He's gazing intently, and he says, what does he tell them? What does he tell them? He, uses, he reuses a phrase that he used the day before. Behold the land of, Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Now, this name, Behold the Lamb of God. Lamb of God was a reference, if we remember from... Um, couple, yes, yes, last week. This is a reference from Isaiah chapter 53. This has to do with the suffering of Jesus, that he was the suffering servant prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. And so he says, behold the Lamb of God. This is the second time he said it. And yesterday when he said it, people just listened. But today something is different. What happens differently today that didn't happen the day before? People follow him. People begin to follow Christ. And it says that two disciples, two disciples left and started to follow Jesus. Now, this word follow does not mean I've now become a permanent disciple. The, the word here used for follow means to just walk behind. They're literally, they, they've been over here by John, and they're, now they're over here behind Jesus, and they're walking behind Jesus. And you kind of get a sense because in in verse 38, Jesus turns and addresses them first. They don't address Jesus first. So we don't know how long they walked around behind him before he turns around and says, hey, what are you doing? It, and I kind of get the sense, you know, these are two guys who are, are probably friends. They've, they've been following John the Baptist, listening to his words. They've been listening to him talk about Jesus because it's all he did was, was point the way to Christ. And 
you get the sense they're probably walking behind Jesus going, all right, we kind of know who this guy is. We want to know more about him, but I'm not going to talk to him first. You know, he's elbowing the guy next to him. You talk to him first. I'm not going to talk to him first. Yeah, I'm too, I'm, I'm too shy. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. So they walk behind him and it's uncomfortable enough that Jesus does something to reach out to them instead. He turns around and graciously breaks the ice here and says to them in verse 38, what are you seeking? Now, in some translations, I had a guy last Wednesday night, his translation said, what do you want? Okay. Now this wasn't like a, like a rude, like, why are you following me? Why are you, you guys are weird. No, it's, it's more like, Hey, I'm just gonna, y'all are being awkward. So I'm going to break the ice here and say, what are you seeking? You know, what are you looking for? And what do they say to him? Rabbi, where are you staying? Where are you staying? Now, if that was today, if this was me following somebody, and, and they said, what do you want? And I said, where do you live? Where are you staying? That would be such a creepy thing, right? Okay. But they could have answered him all sorts of things because people came to Jesus for all kinds of reasons. Some of them came because they wanted him to feed them, especially when we get to the, the passages where he feeds miraculously 5,000 people um, in one go. And, and some of them came to him for healing for themselves. Some of them came for healing for people that they loved. Um, and some of them followed him because they liked his teachings, but they, you know, they didn't really want to go all the way and become a disciple. They instead answer, instead of any of those options, they say, where are you staying? Because what they really want to do is they want to spend time with Jesus. They want to spend time in his presence. They want to get to know him. And he understands from what they said that that's the case. He, he, he says, all right, you want to get to know me? You want to know where I'm staying? What does he say to them in response? Come, come and you will see. Come and see. And this, I, I read two different commentators, and both of them latched onto this phrase. Come and see should be a watchword of the Christian faith. That this is, um, this is part of our response to skepticism about who Christ is and, and what his claims are and whether or not the Bible is true and whether or not God is good. When, when we begin to, to bear witness to these things to people in our life and they're skeptical about it, we should say, look, come and see, come and taste that the Lord is good. And because I know you'll find out that it's true. I know when, once you, you follow me to church, you, you follow me into the word of God, come and see that the word is good. Come and come and see that these things are true. And we're going to see this phrase repeated in the next section. Philip says the same thing to his friend, Nathaniel, come and see. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, one thing that I skipped here. Um, in verse 38, they ask, he asks them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? This word rabbi is a Hebrew word. And it says in the ESV, it says, which means teacher. The word teacher is written in Greek. The word rabbi is Hebrew. And what he's done here, what John has done here is He's been faithful to recount the exact words that were said, and then he's translated it for his audience. So here we know he's actually writing to a primarily Greek audience. They may not have known the original Hebrew words that were used, and some of these words are very important. So John wants to include them, like the word rabbi, and then to make sure his audience understands, he translates it as teacher. He does it three times in the two sections that we're looking at. He does it here. It says rabbi, which means teacher. In verse 41, we see the word Messiah. Messiah, Messiah what does it say that it means? Which, which means Christ. Which means Christ. Good. And then in verse um, 42, at the end of verse 42, he uses the name Cephas, Cephas. which is a Hebrew name. For and then that's translated to what? Peter. Peter. So in, uh, in Greek, this is Christos and Petros. And so Messiah, if we remember from, from our previous lessons, Messiah and Christos both mean 
the anointed one. This is a reference to all of the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah, that he would come and fulfill the threefold office of the Messiah. Those that were anointed were prophets, priests, and kings, and the Messiah, the anointed one, would roll up all three of those roles in one person, sent by God to redeem a people for himself. This name Cephas is a word that means rock or stone, and Petros is the Greek word that also means rock or stone. And so here he's translating this for his Greek audience, but he's being faithful to what was originally said in the conversation. Okay, so Jesus says, come and you will see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. Now, what, what time is that? What, what time is the 10th hour? 10 p.m.? That's a good guess, because we, we account things by the Roman um, way of counting time, which is from like midnight to noon, and then from noon to midnight. But the Jews didn't do that. They, they counted it from sunrise to sundown, which means that the 10th hour, if sunrise is about 6 a.m., and then sundown is about 6 p.m., the 10th hour would be 6 plus 6 is noon, and then uh, so the 10th, it would be 4 p.m. So the 10th hour is about 4 p.m. in our way of counting time. And this says that they stayed the day with him. So they met him at 4 p.m., and then they went back to where he was staying, and they spent the remainder of the day with him, just talking, just listening to what he had to say. And we don't, we don't, we're not privy to the details of that conversation, of the time that they spent with him, but we do know the result. They came to a conclusion by the end of that time with him that he was somebody special, that he was who? Who did they think he was by the end of that conversation? Messiah. The Messiah. We know that because in verse 41, Andrew goes to his brother, Simon, and says that. We have found the Messiah. That's a big claim. Okay, this is somebody that the Jews have been looking for for centuries. They have been waiting for this. And they say, we have found him. So, um, in verse, let's, but let's, before we get there, let's back up to verse 40. So in verse 40, it says, um, can you read for, reread for me verse, verses 40 and 41? Okay. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. Very good. So there's two disciples that have followed, walked behind Jesus, so to speak. One of their names is Andrew. And who is the other one? Uh, Simon, the son of John. Well, Simon is Andrew's brother and Andrew has to go find him. So he's not with them yet. Okay. I'll give you a hint. It's a trick question. It doesn't actually say. Yeah. <laughs> You're hunting for it, but it's not there. It says one of them was Andrew, and then we go, who was the other guy? We don't, it doesn't say. So from that, we know a guy who never includes himself in any listing anywhere in this whole gospel. And who's that? John. John. And it's John, the most likely evangelist. John. That's right. John the Evangelist. Um, it's, it's most likely John Evangelist. That's a long word. For, and we, we kind of know this for two reasons. One, because it's not included. And he's so detailed about everything else he includes except himself and things related to him. And two, the details of this, of this recounting are, are very specific. And even the hour of the day and the specific words that they used. And so we get a hint here that this is someone who has a personal eyewitness testimony to these events. John is writing this from his own memory of what happened. And so we get a, hint, a, a sense that he was there for this. He's been there since verse 19. 
because remember he was a follower of John the Baptist. So he was there when John the Baptist had these conversations. He was there for each one of these days. And then now on the fourth day, wait, the third day, the next day, next day. Yeah, we're on the third day. Now he's being introduced to Christ. And so our two disciples are Andrew and very confidently we can say John. And what is Andrew's knee-jerk reaction when he learns that this man is the Messiah? He goes in and he does something. What does he go and do? In verse 41, he found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah. That's right. Andrew goes and gets Simon, who will also be called Peter. And this Simon is related to him. How? Own brother. This is his brother. This is his family. And so this is a pattern we're going to start to see, that as people meet Christ, they go and find somebody in their life that's important to them and say, look, I found the Messiah. I found the good news. I, I understand the gospel, and you're important to me, and I want you to have the good news. And so he goes and finds somebody in his own family. That's Simon, who will be called Peter. And Simon becomes one of the, um, the most central figures in the early New Testament church. He becomes one of the inner circle of Jesus' disciples. We talk about 12 apostles, but then there's almost this inner circle. We don't have a special name for them, but we recognize that Peter, James, and John, not Andrew, but Peter, James, and John got to spend some of the most intimate moments seeing some of Christ's miracles, teachings. He Sometimes he would pull them aside and take them with him, leave the rest of the disciples, and he would go do something special with just them. And Simon Peter is one of those. And he was, not, he was not sent to Jesus by John the Baptist. He was brought to Jesus by his brother. And that's something that's important for us to notice. So Andrew goes and gets Simon and says, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. In verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John or in some translations we'll see the son of Jonah or son of Jonas, all the same name, you, will, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So here we see this word looked again. And here it means even more than what it did for John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a, a, a mere mortal. He was a just human. It, when he saw, he could only see what Christ was doing. He was gazing intently to learn but he could only see what Christ was doing. When Jesus looks at Peter, he sees who he actually is. He sees inside him. He sees his heart and his identity. And he says, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. But listen to the verb tense here. He says, you shall be called Cephas. So he sees not only who Peter is, but he also sees who he will be who he will become as Christ pours out his life over the next three years into Peter through his ministry to teach him, to train him, to, uh, to save and sanctify him. He sees what Peter will become, and he calls him Cephas, meaning rock. So this, is, this right here is a divine understanding of who somebody is. And we get a hint about this. Um, if we look just one page over in chapter 2, John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Can you read those two verses for me, please? Yeah. Uh, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. Very good. So he, he knows what's inside man. He, he doesn't have to have, he doesn't have to trust what somebody says. He doesn't have to have faith in them. He, he doesn't have to just believe what they say. He actually knows what's going on in their heart. So here we see a, an example of that when he meets Peter. Now that's the end of this day. And then in verse 43, we start the fourth day. This is the very next day. It says the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. Now, it doesn't say that he went to Galilee. It says he's made a decision to go to Galilee. But before he leaves 
for Galilee, remember he's in Bethany, and if I was to draw a terrible map, we've got, I think this is the Dead Sea and the Jordan River. This is the Jordan River. On the Jordan River nearby is Bethany. Bethany, that's where they are. And then over in this area, this region is Galilee. So this is a lake, or this the sea. And in Galilee, we've got cities like Cana and Nazareth. These are important cities. And so this is all Galilee. And Jesus has decided to go back to Galilee. That's too many E's. So, but before he leaves and goes to Galilee, he goes and finds another person. Who does he go and find? He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Very good. He goes and finds Philip and says, follow me. So Philip now is is now walking behind Jesus and he's listening to what he's teaching and he's learning. And Philip says, I, I can't go to Galilee yet. I've got to go talk to somebody. So Philip, it says in verse 44, was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. These are, they, they're all townsmen now. And it, it, it kind of makes me think, does this mean that, um, especially since he included these details, have Andrew and and John, have Andrew and Peter been talking with Jesus and, and they've been saying, you know, there's this guy that lives near where we do named Philip and he's here too. Maybe we should go talk to him and Jesus goes and personally gets him. I, I kind of get the impression that that's what's going on. You know, they're thinking, they're thinking in their head, man, I, there's this guy who's important to us, our friend from back home. We need to share this with him too. And so I'm going to kind of point an arrow sort of like this. They now both go get their friend and encourage Jesus to go get Philip. So Philip, in verse 45, it says Philip found Nathanael. Now Nathanael, Nathan, Philip's conversation with Nathanael is interesting, okay? It says, Philip says to Nathanael, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, Philip is, is borrowing, is, is bringing the weight of the prophecies of Moses and the other prophets, and he's saying, you remember all that stuff that we've studied? You, those things that we know, the things that we've been looking for, we've found that in Christ. He's, he's referencing Old Testament scripture to point to Jesus and encourage Nathaniel to come which tells us that Philip and Nathaniel were not unreligious guys. These were not guys who were uneducated. They spent time studying the scriptures. They, they were of the group of people who were earnestly looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, and they know about their Bibles. And Philip says, we found him. He says, Jesus, and in the, in the original text, it's ordered like this, Jesus, son of Joseph, comma, of Nazareth. In other words, in Hebrew, it, it's more appropriate to say this is their name, this is the family of origin, and then where they come from. And this part right here is the sticking point for Nathaniel. What is Nathaniel's concern about this claim? What does he say in verse 46? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, there's something that we need to know here. Uh, Nathaniel is from Cana, and we're going to end up in Cana in chapter 2. They actually go to Cana, and we're going to study that. But you'll notice they're both in Galilee. Nathaniel would have already known where Nazareth was and what it was like. Nazareth was not a big place. It was a little podunk backwater town in Galilee. It was not a place of great commerce. It was not a place of great learning. It was not a great pla a place of great uh, religious affection. It was a nothing town. And there were some accounts that make us, um, that, that give us evidence that it may have been an immoral town. And so it's not to say that can anything good come out of an immoral nothing town of Nazareth, because even in a place like, I, and I'm going to make a reference here to the Old Testament, um, you may have heard of the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah, and there was a man there named Lot. 
which was the nephew of Abraham, and he lived in one of these towns, and, and he was a righteous man, but he lived in some very sinful towns that everybody there participated in public displays of sin. And, and so even in these two really bad towns, something good can come out of it. But what he's talking about here is not can anything that's kind of good come out of it. You just claim that the Messiah came out of Nazareth. This is the best. This is the pinnacle. This is, this is excellence right here. You're telling me that excellence came out of here? Now, remember, he's also referring to Old Testament scriptures. And if Nathaniel knows his Bible, then he would have known the Messiah was not supposed to be born in Nazareth. So one of the things that we can read about in some of the other Gospels is the actual birth account of Jesus. And when he was born, there was a star in the sky that guided some wise men, some, some um, learned men from uh, neighboring countries to travel and to meet him and to worship him. And when they arrive in the, in the play, in nearby where Jesus is, they go straight to the top. They go to King Herod and they say, we've come here to worship the king of the Jews. Where is he? We want to meet him. Well, Herod doesn't know, and he's kind of a little scared. He goes and asks the experts in the Jewish law, and he says, tell me, where is the king of Israel supposed to be born? And they go, oh, the Messiah. Well, according to the Old Testament, that's supposed to be the city of David, which is Bethlehem. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Well, Bethlehem is not Nazareth. And so Nathaniel would have gone, uh, there's a guy from Nazareth claims to be the Messiah. You're snookered. I, I don't know why you're, why he's convinced you, but I'm having trouble believing this. And what is Philip's response to the skepticism of Nathaniel? Come and see. Come and see. There we get it again. We see come and see. Come and see. You don't believe me? Just come and see. Because I know once you meet this guy, you're going to know that what I'm saying is true. So he comes to see. Now in verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, what a weird thing to say about somebody. Like for us, there's a lot of context that's lost there. But he uses this word, Israelite. Now, Israelites, if I can spell anything today, Israelites are descendants of a man named Israel. Israel is not a country primarily. It is the name of a man. It's, a na it's the name of a man whose original name was Jacob. Jacob is one of the patriarchs of the Jewish faith. We had um, Abraham, who was called out of the land of Uz. He was a moon worshiper at that time. And the Lord met him and said, I, I'm going to lead you to a place that I'm going to give to you and make you a, a, a father of many nations. So Abraham has faith and follows God. The covenant that God made with Abraham, he renews with his son Isaac, and then Isaac has a son named Jacob, and he renews that same covenant with Jacob. We'll see in just a minute. Jacob, his name literally means deceiver. It's a Hebrew idiom called to grasp the heel which means to deceive. That's what Jacob means. When he was born, when he came out, he was a twin, and he was holding on to the heel of his brother, Esau. And that actually ended up becoming who he was. It, that, we're talking about a family that's kind of jacked up because even his own parents taught him to be a deceiver. And so when he meets God, when he wrestles with God, God gives him a new name. He gives him the name Israel. And so Jesus here is not saying you're a descendant of Jacob. He's saying you're an Israelite. You are a man who wrestles with God. The Israelite people at their very worst were descendants of Jacob. At their very best, they were Israelites. And he said, here is an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. This is somebody that, is, that has integrity. What you see on the outside is what's on the inside of this man. So Jesus is now using his divine ability to see inside a man and understand who he is. And Nathaniel's a little taken aback. In verse 48, Nathaniel says to him, how do you know me? I, I, I've never seen you in, in my life. How do you know me? He's still skeptical. And Jesus responds, 
before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, that means that Philip didn't see him under the fig tree either. So let's say here's Jesus, and there's people around him following him. Way over here under this fig tree, this is my stick figure fig tree. My neighbor has a fig tree, but it's more like a bush, so it's kind of hard to, to draw. And, and here's Nathaniel under the fig tree. And Philip has gone to find him. And even, even Philip doesn't see him under the fig tree because it's before he, founds it, before he finds him. And so now Jesus has not just seen who Nathaniel is on the inside. He can also see the past of where he's been. He, he can see things about him that are very supernatural. And Nathaniel immediately responds with, with a, a claim of who Jesus is that is, it's superlative. He says, what does he say? What does Nathaniel say in verse 49? Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Okay, now did he address him as rabbi the first time? When he says, how do you know me? Because when Andrew no. and John came to see Jesus, they, they immediately addressed him as rabbi. Nathaniel doesn't. Yeah. It's, it's almost kind of rude. You know, I, I've heard about you because you're from Nazareth. You, you can't be a rabbi, all right? You can't be a teacher. He immediately says, Rabbi, now. You are the son of God. You're the son of God, king of Israel. Here he's referring to him now as with respect as a teacher. As son of God, he's saying that he is deity. And as the king of Israel, he's claiming his sovereignty. He has made one flying leap from total skepticism to, wow, you really are who you say you are. I believe. We really have found the Messiah. And, and that seems like a big jump for us, but we got to remember this is a man. He's been studying the scriptures. He's been, he's been looking for this man. And here he now sees someone with a divine power not only did he see who he was on the inside, he's, he's seen where he's been. And Jesus, I, I, get, I get the sense that in verse 50 and 51, Jesus is smiling when he says this. Sort of like when a, a child comes to a conclusion that you're like, wow, that's all it took for you to get that? <laughs> and, and, and like if you're a parent or an adult that's working with a child and you're, and like, you're just kind of smiling at how how excited they are about this and you're feeling that excitement with them. So in verse 50, Jesus answers him because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? Oh, you will see greater things than these. You stick with me. You will see much greater things than these. In verse 51, he says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. This is a reference, let me see if I can squeeze it into this little spot here, to Genesis chapter 28. Jacob, you remember the, the guy named Jacob that we were talking about? Jacob has a dream. And in his dream, and do when you get a chance, go back and read Genesis chapter 28. Jacob has a dream. He sees a ladder that reaches up to heaven. And there are angels ascending and descending on it. And at the top, above the ladder, is the Lord. And the Lord speaks to him in this dream, renewing the covenant that he's made with Abraham and Isaac, and now with Jacob. And Jesus is now appropriating this image to himself, this image of this ladder. So do go back and read it, because then you'll understand better what he's, what he's saying in this, in this verse. He's saying, I'm the means by which access is made to the Father. No one comes to the Father except by me. And you, Nathaniel, are going to get to see that. You're going to get to see the heavens opened, uh, divine knowledge and blessings poured out on the earth through me, because I'm the Son of God, here in person. And that you will find that I am the means by which you can be saved, by which you can be reconciled to the Father, by which you can make it to heaven, so to speak. You're going to get to see that. 
those are the greater things that you're going to get to see. And that wraps up now the fourth day in our story. And it wraps up John chapter one. So we put on your party hats because we made it through an entire chapter of our Bible study in only six weeks. Yes. <laughs> so questions, thoughts. Uh, I, I had no idea. It's like one passage will have so many you know, deep meanings behind it. <laughs> so, and re- cross reference to what was said earlier and all that. So, yeah. I I get to see that part of it only with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... When I read, I read it like a story. It's still very interesting for me. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's definitely uh, revealing to see it from you know, a teacher's perspective. Well, good, good. I stand on the shoulders of other very smart people who have studied this. Um, You know, when I study, I study old commentaries written over 150 years ago. In fact, this this book right here, the paper in this book is 150 years old. You see that the spine's coming off. (laughs) That's how old this book is. And, um, you know, these are men that, before the internet, before TV, they spent their time really studying and researching and, and then writing down for others to learn. And so I'm, this is not new revelation coming from Scott. This is me borrowed from people that have wrestled with God over these issues and, and over these verses. So we're just walking in their footsteps. I, um, I, th- this, this is fun to me. This is a lot of fun. So I'm glad, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Sounds like you're enjoying it. I'm glad. Yeah, I am. Absolutely. Good. I am. Good. Well, we've run over on time and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Cause these things are important. Um, but before we let you go, how about I'll close in prayer yep. and then I promise I'll get you. Um, that's on my high priority list is to get you some stuff on the curse of sin. And then you can, sure. you can read on that. Cool. Will do. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we have really enjoyed time in your word today. I thank you for the time that I get to spend personally with Famsi, and I thank you for the insight that you have allowed us to understand by your spirit. I pray that you would continue to do that in my life and in his, that you would help us to understand the deep things of Scripture so that your words can save and sanctify, that you would bring him into Uh, a personal understanding of the gospel that he can put his faith and trust in. And I pray that you would, that you would bring about a personal holiness in our lives. You've called us to be holy because you are holy. It's not a means to attaining salvation. That's only through Jesus, but you have called us to lead lives of holiness so that others would see us and would want the kind of relationship that we have with you. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Peace. Bye.